want to uh, begin as I introduce our speaker, Aaron Good. Um, I uh, heard an interview of Aaron on uh, Project Censored uh, some time ago and uh, was impressed enough to go out and buy his book, uh, American Exception, which I have my copy here. And he, uh, uh, it was a very insightful uh, interview. And um, and so it took me a few months to get around to reading his book, but I was also very impressed by uh, by his book and uh, the insights uh, and his uh, and his writing style, which which uh, I think I'd be correct to say that um, uh, Peter Dale Scott could be considered a mentor. Um, you know, at least you know him, and and uh, the style is, is similar with lots of uh, references and uh, documentation of, of and, uh, and revealing the, uh, the history that we're generally uh, not taught. And I think I was most impressed by the, just the uh, list of books that, um, that you uh, reference, you know, especially uh, books like uh, C. Wright Mills, Sheldon Wolin, who are, and uh, Peter Dale Scott, of course, Michael Hudson, Chalmers Johnson, Parenti, uh, Michael Glennon, um, all excellent books that are, uh, I, you know, would refer people to read also. And um, so his book is really about pulling back that curtain of secrecy and uh, and institutional corruption uh, that allows the, the government to perform illegal acts and, uh, and get away with it. And so with that introduction, I'd like to uh, uh, hand it over to Aaron uh, for uh, tonight's Green Sunday. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I am going to try to share my screen hat now, which I hope I can do easily enough. Um, wait a second, that's the wrong one. Um, no, that should be okay. All right. Um, so you guys all see the screen, right? It says uh, the deep state. On exactly. It. Looks good. Okay. Very good. Okay. So I didn't really, this is a little weirder, but I guess I'll just deal with it. Okay. So uh, the deep state is a term that you guys have heard before, and uh, it's associated with Donald Trump now, which does not make me happy uh, and Trump type people, because it's really a term that comes from academics and it's a left-wing critique of uh, the democratic West, the liberal West. So I want to talk today about how America saved fascism from the dustbin of history. And that really is the story of the deep state, unfortunately. And I think that we're seeing it unravel right now, really. These two projects that were launched at the end of World War II, which I would say are, um, are really two um, fascist. Uh, they're both fascist projects. One of them is... The U.S., which is kind of a disguised fascism, you could call it parafascism, it, it really is a top-down, oligarchic way of running an empire. Uh, and that's been going on since the end of World War II. They made the decision to go for that. The other one is, of course, Israel. I would say that this other project intertwined with the U.S. project is a, a more old-style kind of blood-and-soil fascism um, that we're seeing now. And uh, the real dimensions of it have been alarming and kind of horrifying for many years. And uh, it's even more um, egregious than I would have guessed before uh, be before 2023. Uh, and, I, and I was never someone who would have said good things about the, the, the Zionist project before 2023. And now uh, I, I find it kind of horrifying. So I want to um, take it back, really. Um, this is a, uh, my book. Uh, I wrote about this as a way to try to look at the lawlessness of the state. I was saying, why do we have all these political and uh, cr civilizational crises of like a uh, massive inequality and the uh, breakdown of the rule of law and environmental uh, crises? And uh, we can't do anything about them because there's just some sort of top-down force that seems to be dominating our politics and democracy can't self-correct. And so I set about getting a... A PhD in political science, inspired by Lance DeHaven Smith, and Peter Dale Scott, uh, especially. Those are my two mentors, and I befriended Lance 
uh, and went to conferences with him for over a number of years. He was a, a great friend and mentor. His death was really uh, sad for me. He was a Florida State professor, um, really a great person. Um, and Peter Dale Scott, of course, he is out there in California in the Bay Area. And uh, I may be coming out there to interview him uh, for a documentary film if everything goes as it should, that if the Canadian government might give us a grant to do this, uh, this may happen. So I'll get to see Peter again in person, which will be great. So he's really brilliant and he's a person that I drew from a lot. So the deep state itself comes from Turkey. The idea comes from Turkey, Darren Devlet, and it derives uh, from Turkey where it described a closed network said to be more powerful than the public state. Uh, the Turkish deep state used false flag terror organized by the security apparatus and linked to organized crime. And it grew out of networks that were originally established by NATO's Operation Gladio in order to maintain a stay behind paramilitary force uh, that could potentially become an insurgency if there was ever a communist takeover. So if the Soviets ever came in, they had all these secret armies ready in NATO countries that would be ready to fight the, the communists, okay? But it was pretty clear early on that the Soviets weren't coming. And so these secret armies got repurposed into something different. Okay, the Turkish version was really crazy. There was this car crash. The way it got exposed was in the mid-90s, a car crash near a place called Susserlik. And you had a beauty queen uh, and a minister of parliament and the chief of police. And then the world's most wanted terrorist, uh, the head of the Grey Wolves. And they were all in a car together. And it was very strange. It was as if... Bin Laden and Dick Cheney and uh, Taylor Swift were all in a car accident together or something. It would be that level of strangeness. Somebody's got some explaining to do. And in the Turkish case, it was like, well, we kind of have this deep state that, uh, you know, stages terror attacks and does whatever it wants to manipulate politics as it sees fit. Uh, and so that became uh, something that that scholars and people who are Turkish specialists looked at. But they didn't really make the connections to the U.S. side as much. Okay, the New York Times in 2013 wrote about the deep state and said that it was an important new term. Uh, it called it a hard-to-perceive level of government or super control that exists regardless of elections and that may thwart popular movements or radical change. Some have said Egypt is being manipulated by its deep state. So this was the New York Times actually pointing this out and still treating it as like a sort of normal uh, term because this is pre-Trump. And it's uh, the point is that it's a sort of top-down control, uh, political control that overrides democracy. So they basically get that right. On Bill Moyers, a guy named Mike Lofgren, who was a Republican uh, congressional staffer, I believe, and he eventually wrote a book on the deep state, and he wrote this article on the deep state for Bill Moyers. And he called the deep state or defined it as a hybrid association of key elements of government and parts of top-level finance and industry that is effectively able to govern the United States with only limited reference to the consent of the governed as normally expressed through elections. So that's a fairly good answer for what the deep state really is. It has a different, he has a different understanding of it than the Donald Trump one, which is, seems to conform to like the bureaucracy and the, uh, that, that is there, that is thwarting whatever Trump was wanting to do. That seemed to be the, uh, the sort of Trumpian definition of it. Now, another way of studying these political arrangements that are not what they're cracked up to be in the Constitution uh, comes from Peter Dale Scott and his idea of parapolitics, which was a system or practice of politics in which accountability is consciously diminished. And he wrote about this because of uh, things in the 60s and the 70s that were coming out about covert operations and other things that had happened to, to impact politics in the U.S. and around the world that were done by intelligence agencies and that were done covertly with cover stories and that were done to really deceive people about what the government was actually doing. And that is a problem for a democracy because a democracy is supposed to be uh, made up of citizens who understand what the government's policies are and can then uh, make choices in elections based on what policies the candidates have actually pursued in the past and are advocating in the future. But of course, if they're lying about what the policies are, then it becomes ridiculous. You don't even know what the government is doing that you elected, and uh, you don't have any recourse. Peter eventually gets away from the narrow sort of parapolitics field, uh, in part because he's unhappy about some kind of overly conspiracist type of people who uh, embrace the, the label of parapolitics. And so he comes up with deep politics, which is more expansive, and it's all those political practices and arrangements 
uh, that are usually repressed in the public discourse rather than acknowledged. So this is a bigger, uh, a, a much bigger thing. It's a so uh, many many things that are just not discussed would be in uh, deep deep politics. So especially things like the relationship, the sort of institutionalized relationship between organized crime and the business class in a certain uh, city or you know any kind of area. Like these are sort of institutionalized deeper things, not just one-off parapolitical chicanery, but like things that are more systemic. He wrote about a deep political system also uh, as a system where that, that habitually resorts to decision-making and enforcement procedures outside as well as inside those publicly sanctioned by law and society. So he was trying to write about the U.S. system, and he wasn't saying that it was a dictatorship, but he was saying that it is made up of, of uh, things that work according to the Constitution and laws, but then other times where other forces take over and hold sway and can determine outcomes. Another scholar that is important to think about here is uh, William Bartlett. He wrote a book recently about apex crime. The book is called Blurring Intelligence Crime. But here he's talking about a watershed event involving government in the support of a contested political and social order and its primary opponent as the obvious offender, which is then subject to a confirmation bias. So here you're taking a, a political situation that is kind of fraught in one way or another. And then you have the apex crime, some crime that comes in and it changes, it resolves a political conflict in a particular way. And there's a villain and the villain just happens to be the uh, enemy of, uh, you know, the enemy of the oligarchy, the enemy of the regime. An example of this would be the JFK assassination where they have this guy Oswald. Oh, and it was a communist, you know, a communist shooting from a window, shoots three shots, scores like eight hits with his three shots or <laughs> and, uh, I think nine, maybe, because there's another random guy that got hit, too, on the sidewalk. So uh, and it was a communist, right? He, and then, of course, the more you look at it, then you're, it seems like he was play acting as a communist and was sent around to different places to pretend to be a communist. But the result is the public thinks a communist killed the president. Uh, and then when the president's brother gets killed a few years later, uh, Robert Kennedy Sr., and he had planned to investigate his brother's assassination, we found out about 40 years later, thanks to David Talbot, who's also in the Bay Area out there with you guys. Um, they The next patsy is a Palestinian, okay? Uh, that is remarkable, I think, and worth noting. Okay, uh, the deep state itself and people writing about it in the West, like outside of Turkey, really the first person to do that was Ola Tanander. Uh, he is a, a Swedish academic, and he's at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. He's retired now, but he was at the original uh, peace research place, the one founded by Johan Galtung. And he wrote this essay, Democratic State versus Deep State, Approaching the Dual State of the West. And this was a, a real, this is a great article um, that he wrote. And it really explains uh, the, the, the parallels and the sort of continuity between the more overt kind of fascism and then what evolves in the West. It's a really great piece. So Peter Dale Scott builds on things written by Ola Tanander because they were friends and they even met at a conference, I believe, in Europe um, before Peter wrote his book, American War Machine. But he wrote about the deep state and described it like this, or one particular aspect of it. Adnan Khashoggi, Khashoggi BCCI Safari Club, all this weird se late 70s outfit that was set up because the CIA was really busy uh, dealing with the post-Watergate investigations. So there was this sort of alternative setup that wasn't even part of the U.S. government at all. It was just like a bunch of um, sort of clandestine operatives that were uh, in U.S. allied nations, but were right wingers. And they all just said, like, well, we'll just make our own CIA during this time period. And uh, while you guys are so busy in Washington. So he describes this as part of a supranational deep state organic, organic links to the CIA helped to consolidate it. And he says, it's clear that decisions taken at this level by the Safari Club and BCCI were in no way guided by the political determinations of those elected to power in Washington and were instead expressly created to overcome restraints established by political decisions in Washington. So what he's saying is when the CIA and the security agencies were actually tied up and were busy because of scandal and they couldn't really commit the crimes they usually commit, uh, these deep political forces just created their own ad hoc version of the CIA so they could continue to go along, uh, you know, committing all the crimes that they normally do to make political events work out the way they want them to work out. Um, this is, I think, worth noting because 
they could override really they acted in ways that were harmful to the president they probably were involved in things that we don't even uh, totally know about probably more involved in afghanistan than we know about before uh, 1979 and uh, i would really wonder what role they had in uh, in, in the coup and making sure that the 19 or the, the the revolution in iran making sure that it worked out the way that it did but these are all sort of speculative because uh it's even more secrecy than the cia when you think about the deep state is a question of like what is the best analogy or metaphor uh, some people would say it's sort of like an ice an iceberg where most of it is under is under water over the, the national political system like a weather system. I think that there's a logic behind that. Uh, I wrote an American exception that deep state uh, it was misappropriated in the Trump era. Uh, herein, it refers to the various institutions that collectively exercise undemocratic power over state and society. Pluralistic to varying degrees, the deep state is an outgrowth of the overworld of private wealth. It includes most notably the institutions that advance overworld interests through the nexuses containing or sorry, connecting the overworld, the underworld, and the national security organizations that mediate between them. The key there is that it is providing undemocratic governance or top-down governance in a nominal democracy. That's why it's a it's a deep state. If it was just uh, you know Louis Louis the Fourteenth, he didn't need a deep state. He just came out and said, "I am the state," right? So there's no. It's very straightforward. The U.S. case because we have the uh, democracy as a legitimating you know procedural myth or condition or institution they can't come out and uh, just say these things so the deep state exists to allow for uh, dictatorial governance in a way uh, without having to you know deal with the stigma of being a dictatorship so I the way that I try to explain this is that the American state is a, has a tripartite structure. Uh, which is similar to C. Wright Mill's uh, power structure of the United States having three parts. So the democratic state is the one we're taught about uh, in school. We're, we're, we're taught about this so that we learn about elections and you know civic uh, civic engagement and all these things. That's the the nice version that we're told exists. But there's also this Pentagon and national security state, the, the CIA, the FBI. Uh, and they're more secretive and they're kind of organized hierarchically and sometimes they may uh, skirt propriety and uh, the laws in some ways because they're just trying so hard to protect us or whatever uh but then there's the other part of it that kind of overrides everything and that is the deep state which i represent here with uh the, the wall street bull but this is really just the power of oligarchy and it uh it, it dominates both of these other entities the democratic state of course is dominated by oligarchic power in different ways campaign finance systems and all the other ways that uh, the wealthy have to get their way in washington but the national security state itself was very much the uh, product of uh, the oligarchy of corporate wealth it was created by these people it was dreamed up by them and then designed to their specifications to achieve goals that they decided they wanted to achieve in the first place now, you could think of it as even more systemic than that if you think of these other things I mentioned, our democratic state, which is overridden by oligarchic power, but there is some substance to the, the democratic state. It's the, it does separate us in some way from like the fascism of the you know, 1930s because there are pretense, at the very least, there are pretenses and other the things that they have to mean in order to uh, preserve the myth of democracy. And so even that is like, at least it's a saving grace. It's because of that we're able to at least talk about things like this, for example, and not worry about the secret police coming in and, and, and killing us. Now, if they wanted to kill any political person, they have to be kind of clever about it and, you know, have someone else do it. That's a little bit better than having the, you know, Schutzelstaffel come in and take you away, maybe. I mean, it is better than that, I will say that. Okay, so... These other entities, uh, the the Pentagon, the national security state, the democratic state, and you have civil society, okay? This makes it more of a systemic thing. But if we think of it as we know it really works, again, even civil society is kind of dominated by 
um, oligarchic power, deep political power, or top-down power, or oligarchic power. It neutralizes the ability of civil society institutions to act as a check against top-down anti-democratic forces. So people who are marching against uh, wars or protesting other things, but in the public interest, uh, they have a difficult time because other entities that are connected to oligarchic interests are better funded and better organized because they have all the money and money kind of animates everything in, in a capitalist society. And so taking advantage of that, it's uh, the deep state kind of dominates civil society as well, or deep political power, or oligarchy. Now, when we look at the political thinkers of the left or the right, they both, unfortunately, in terms of like liberalism to neoconservatism, they kind of are compatible with fascism or parafascism, you know, disguised fascism all across the board in ways that we are not really ready to grapple with as a whole. So Leo Strauss is a conservative person. He's a, you know, you could think of him as a Hobbesian uh, in a sense, just like all sort of more right-wing realist types. And he, he's not exactly, the neoconservatives aren't exactly realists, but they have a certain kind of logic to them like that, it, it, which is expressed here by Leo Strauss. Uh, he says, are the maximum for, maxims of foreign policy really different from the maxim, maxims on which gangs of robbers act? Can they be different? Are cities not compelled to use force and fraud to take away from other cities what belongs to the latter if they are to prosper? Do they not come into being by usurping a part of the Earth's surface, which by nature belongs equally to all others? So this is a really, uh, it's a Hobbesian kind of uh, almost like Darwinian way of looking at, at politics. It's a, a state of total crisis or emergency. And if you're not out there uh, being the strongest one, then you could be destroyed. You, you have to have, a, you, you need a, a state that will protect uh, protect itself, protect the nation state and dominate others if need be because that's the only way you can be safe it's a very hobbesian kind of thing so this is a person we associate with neoconservatism and uh, the american right problem is that the the liberal the classical liberal of that influenced america so much in the american constitution and the thinking of the framers of the constitution is john locke and he is famous for saying life liberty and property right uh, which is Thomas Jefferson is smart enough to change it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for PR reasons. But life, liberty, and property, if you're putting property as like at the center of things that are holy, that's a that's a choice. Um, but when he writes about prerogative, about the state being able to do whatever the state needs to do or wants to do because there's an emergency, he really is a, about a Hobbesian when it comes down to it. Uh, he writes, uh, but who shall judge when this power is made right use of this power of using emergency state power uh, to respond to some crisis? Um, Locke answered that if the legislature is unable to check the prerogatives of an executive, quote, there can be no judge on earth. In such an instance, a ruler is using a power that was never his since people cannot consent to the rule of those who would harm them. Under such circumstances, the people are to make an appeal to heaven at the opportune moment. This is to say that the people have the right to revolt. So John Locke, the person who is the advocate of constitutional liberalism and, and so on, um, when it comes down to it, he says that, well, if there's states in an emergency, you can't really, uh, you can't really constrain them. Uh, and then who's going to really judge if the state is using that the right way or not, or if the sovereign is using that correctly? Well, there really can't be in that case. It's just, I guess you have to have a re revolution. The point is that John Locke is basically saying that the state has to be able to protect itself. It can't be restrained by laws and so on. And if there's a, a if the executive becomes despotic under these circumstances, then you just have to have a revolution. Uh, this is really a seed of a kind of fascistic kind of government uh, when you when you look at the way it it plays out. Now, more famously, taking this to really right to its destination is Carl Schmidt, uh, and he was a Nazi. I'm not just randomly calling him names. Um, he wrote famously, sovereign is he who decides on the exception, meaning that the real sovereign authority is whoever gets to decide when the laws do not apply because there's an emergency. The exception is a case of extreme peril, a danger to the existence of the state. The state of exception is so perilous that it cannot be circumscribed factually and made to conform to a preformed law. He is sovereign who definitely decides whether this normal situation actually exists. So he's saying that you're really in charge if you're able to say like, you know what, 
there's an emergency. It's time for an exception to the rule of law. I'm the sovereign, I've got to act. We need to uh, secure the state. And tr also a corollary to that is that somebody has to decide when the state of exception doesn't exist. And that would be the same sort of entity, the sovereign power. If it, they decide if it's normal and if the laws can apply in the first place. And if not, then it's a state of exception. Now, Ola Tanander, he summed up Schmidt and the sovereign and the way its relevance to liberal democracy. He said, liberal myopia has made political science into an ideology of the sovereign because indisputable evidence for the existence of the sovereign is brushed away as fear, fantasy, or conspiracy. What he's saying here is that liberal political science is kind of a myopic and deluded in a sense because it cannot grapple with the lawlessness of... Uh, of the state in the West, that it's uh, it, liberal political science and political science in the West, which I have a doctorate in, um, is based on assumptions of pluralism, democratic pluralism, and the rule of law and transparency. It, because if you don't have those things, then the methodology of conventional political science doesn't make any sense. You're, you're dealing with uh, pu public opinion polling data and other facts that you have to look at as like hard data. And then you're trying to th make, you know, find correlations about this or that or causations about this or that. But it's all kind of a ridiculous exercise if the state can just do whatever it wants and lie about it and commit whatever crimes it wants. Which, if you look at, I document many of these in my book, there's just, that seems to be the modus operandi of the, the U.S. empire since the end of World War II. I make a distinction, and I don't do this as much in the book. I've thought about this more recently. I don't spend a bunch of time in the book actually making the argument for about fascism because it just didn't seem like it was important. But increasingly, I, I come back to this and I, I don't do it because I want to get, call the my political adversaries names. It's that it's really something worth understanding uh, because it's so important. We did not really defeat this kind of despotism in World War II. So fascism, which we learn about in, when we study World War II, an exceptionalist regime created to maintain oligarchic political hegemony in an industrialized capitalist nation state. I think that would apply to the, you know, to um, Italy, Germany, Japan um, in the 20th century. Parafascism, which is the system I would say that we have, is an ostensibly democratic regime in which oligarchic political hegemony in an industrialized capitalist nation state is maintained by a feckless but visible democratic state a hierarchical security state, and a deep state which can veto democratic politics through various means, including parapolitical violence and manipulation. So that's a lot of words. Maybe that's a clumsy definition, but it, I think it's mostly accurate in what I'm trying to convey. It's, it's top-down rule. It's despotism, the despotism of a fascist regime, but with a cover story of democracy. That's what I argue we essentially have in the United States. And I, I'm. This is kind of a snarky meme. So if this, if anybody thinks these are annoying, uh, I, I am sympathetic. But I made it anyway. This is what it comes down to, really. Wait, it's all oligarchy. Always has been. Okay, this is really the condition that we are facing in the West. It's all the myths about democracy and so on. We've really never transcended oligarchy uh, when it comes down to it. And I, it's really hard to argue that point. Even political science. Uh, Gillens and Page, their article, which came out in maybe 2015, they using even the boring and uh, sort of sterile and obscurantist methods of political science, they were able to show that the average person in the United States has essentially no political influence whatsoever, that it's really elites and uh, the wealthy people, those interest groups that really control the political process and they get what they want in politics, not uh, the regular people at all. So they essentially have shown that the U.S. is not really functionally a democracy. The way that this all starts is uh, it, it's it's whether you're talking about fascism or empire, this whole thing that we are seeing unravel now, it it all goes back to the sheep. OK, in, in a strange way, Britain's enclosure movement. I'm sorry, I, I meant to turn these sound effects off, but I think they're on here anyway. So just, I think there's only a couple elites enclose the commons in Britain. Right. They what used to be the commons where the, the common people could grow crops and, you know, raise livestock, some wealthy connected people 
decided they would wall these off and say, okay, this land is actually ours now. And that gave rise to the first modern industry in, well, modern, the first, you know, capital, real capitalist enterprise in England, which was the textile industry. And uh, this helps elites to accumulate wealth, elites who were not part of the aristocracy. It also leads to poor laws, which are like a kind of welfare. But this wasn't like because people were feeling generous. It's because they actually had the uh, ability to uh, make a, to sustain themselves materially taken from them. And so uh, they needed something to keep people from being so desperate and starving that they would rise up and kill everybody. This is what creates capitalism. Okay, this is really where capitalism comes from and the capitalist state. And it has other consequences. Like this, this is my, maybe probably my favorite book from 1584. It's called Discourse on Western Planting. And this, uh, it, it's a, it's like a policy document. It's like, this is like an old policy planner or something like this. He says, in America, infinite numbers may be set to work to the unburdening of the realm at home. What they're saying is that due to the enclosure movement and other problems with, you know, land tenure and such caused by that, you might, we're going to need to like send people to deal with these pressures. We can go to America because it's so big. We should send them there. First place they went really was was Ireland. Like the oppression of Ireland really uh, takes off during this time period uh, because they need to go west. There's all these population pressures. And so they go to Ireland, they set up ranches. Eventually they have the potato famine where people are starving and the British own all the good land and they're exporting you know, cattle and crops and such. And the Irish are like on the margins e eating potatoes and then the potatoes all get sick and the potatoes all die, right? So. I mean, this really nasty what the British did, and they just kept going west. They went all the way west over across the Atlantic Ocean after that. So this gives rise to something that this capitalist, this early period of capitalism, we could say has qualities of proto-fascism. Okay, colonialism, uh, British, especially British settler colonialism in Ireland and North America. Um, these have just sort of vicious, pre-modern kind of barbarous aspects of them. Uh, slavery, you know, which is like, backward and barbarous but also now part of a, a, a an emerging capitalist economy jim crow is a kind of a fascist uh, proto-fascist regime opium wars and different imperial gangster enterprises i mean these are all like a, a kind of crude you can't really call this lawful liberal democracy uh, but it's it's not the same as like you know hitler either it's a it's like a, a proto-fascism i mean it's just i think a way to describe it the U.S. Western expansion, vicious, uh, involves lying and other sort of uh, deceptions to be able to expand all the way to the West. The way that they get the Western, a huge chunk of the, the West in the United States comes from the Mexican-American War, which had a kind of phony pretext to be able to use to start the war uh, in 1845. The even around the world, people start copying Western imperialism. Well, most notably Japan. Japan is the one like non-white European country that embraces uh, Western industrialization and eventually fascism and imperialism, they have people dress up like uh, Koreans and kill the queen of Korea in 1895. This is uh, this would have made the Nazis uh, impressed. The U.S., meanwhile, to, for its imperial enterprises out, outside of the continental U.S., uh, it's 1898 and the uh, Spanish-American War, which is kicked off with a, a pretext, uh, something either a false flag or an exploited accident who really knows, but it, Spain wouldn't have had any reason to want to attack the U.S. or provoke them into this war. Uh, and it did lead to the Spanish-American War, which led to the U.S. acquiring its first overseas uh, colonies, uh, really, um, Philippines and de facto Cuba, Guam, Puerto Rico. Okay, fascism itself comes from because it emerges in the 20th century, it comes from the Roman term, the facies, right? Or the Roman, the symbol of the Roman state, the facies, which is a pretty fascist if you stop and think it makes sense. It's uh, the, the stick. You hit someone with a stick in the face, you know, uh, it, it breaks, right? It's a problem. It's just one stick. Uh, but you, you, you bundle them all together and you tie them together and then you, you hit someone in the face with it. That's more powerful, okay? That's a good metaphor for the state. A bunch of sticks that you get hit in the face with. Uh, and so that's where the, the fascism comes from. Uh, it really was the symbol of the Roman state. And, uh, you know, the, they've got the salute too. Uh, the U.S. symbol uh, of the Senate even has uh, the facies on it, right? So this is like, it just goes very far deep. 
into the U.S. history and and the the West really. Uh, but when you get a what fascism was really about in the 20th century, look at um, it, look at this uh, in New York Times. Churchill extols fascismo for Italy. He declares it has taught the world the antidote for communism. Um, charmed by Mussolini, his conference in Rome, he says, dealt with improving condition of the wage earner. So you see what fascism really was, which if you didn't already know this, I mean, they were very much the solution to the, uh, the potential of socialist or communist revolution. So you need to bring in somebody with an iron fist to like get things to make sure that the economy runs with a heavy hand of the state to make sure fa communism doesn't uh, triumph. So fascist Italy, you know, they've got all the, the, the vibes of like the references to the ancient past and so on and the imperial grandeur. Uh, Nazi Germany, same sort of weird, creepy iconography, uh, uh, hearkening back to the past, uh, to like, you know, weird Teutonic myths and legends and so on. And the strange uh, Triumph of the Will film uh, with, you've probably seen at some point. Uh, and Imperial Japan, I mean, they made, a, they fetishized a lot of their shoguns and such. This is uh, Ashikaga uh, Yoshimitsu, uh, his golden pavilion. You have people drawing pictures of this. There's the flag, the naval flag with the rays going out in all directions. There's war propaganda like this. I mean, this, uh, this is fascist um, iconography with this reference to traditional empires and such. Uh, and the Japanese stage false flags like uh, in Manchuria to be able to invade Manchuria. So, uh, and the Germans themselves, they stage false flags. Uh, they burned down the Reichstag. That was the conclusion of the Nuremberg uh, tribunals after the war. They said, oh yeah, the Germans, they set the Reichstag fire. And then a few years later, because the U.S. wanted to rehabilitate so many of these Nazis, it turned out that a lot of the people that were likely involved in this Reichstag fire were people that were in the government. And so it, they basically went back to the old story of like, oh, it really was this one communist guy. And uh, the U.S. left, because U.S. leftists often are like, they consider it a mark of sophistication to not believe that there are elite conspiracies uh, by state actors. Uh, apparently so like jacobin writes this how the nazis exploited the reichstag fire to launch a reign of terror well after world war ii they found that the nazis didn't exploit it they said it right so why what has happened to the left where we're like they're afraid even to to accuse nazis of conspiring like they're that like it's this is this goes this shows you part i i think it's a part not the only reason the real reason is that the right has all the money in the world but like part of the weakness of the left in the u.s is that they just they if the state says like we didn't do this this crime the left is often like okay don't don't be a conspiracy theorist don't accuse the nazis of burning down the reichstag that's not nice that's uh that's not sophisticated that's you're being a conspiracy theorist right but the nazis did conspire in bad ways though uh like for example when they wanted to invade poland they even the nazis had to stage a pretext to invade poland like even when you're the nazis and you have the fear principle you can't just go and invade a country for no reason. You got to make up a reason for it. So they staged this whole uh, pretext operation to be able to go into Poland in 1939. Now, in the on the U.S. side, this is probably the heart of it. Franklin Roosevelt writing to Colonel House in 1933, he says, the real truth is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. And during World War II, FDR, you know, the probably the most progressive president that the United States ever had. Uh, he also was the president who empowered the Council on Foreign Relations through the State Department to come up with grand strategy for the United States after World War II. And that was done in the War and Peace Studies Project. And it was overseen by people like Alan Dulles. He was one of the main people writing these uh, reports. He wrote a report on security and sovereignty that I believe is still classified to this day and which may have called for uh, the creation of something like a clandestine intelligence service. Uh, it probably did. But the point is that like, this is a very old, this is Wall Street. The Council on Foreign Relations is just Wall Street. It's Wall Street's, you know, people that are paid to think of foreign policy ideas by the richest people in the world, Standard Oil, uh, you know, DuPont, JP Morgan, all these huge companies. That's who uh, sponsors the Council on Foreign Relations. And Alan Dulles, of course, that one is very important. He's Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, corporate attorney for some of the most powerful uh, transnational corporations. 
So if you're going to, they make the decision, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, that the U.S. should go for global empire and that it should be an American century. That's who they, that's how they package it. They have their, one of their members is Henry Luce. He's a Time Life magazine and Fortune magazine publisher. He wrote his American Century essay in 1941. Most of it is kind of uh, PR, you know, free enterprise kind of uh, propaganda, uh, kind of simplified thinking and presented in altruistic terms. But here there's one passage where he kind of gives the game away. He says, our thinking of world trade today is on ridiculously small terms. In the decade to come, Asia will be worth to us exactly zero or else it will be worth to us four, five, ten billions of dollars a year. And the latter are the terms we must think in or else confess a pitiful impotence. Um, it's just one passage, but it's like there, he's finally saying it at least. It's, there's a lot of money to be made with this plan. Uh, and that turned out to be the case. But America at that time had uh, some strong kind of social democratic tendencies. The four freedoms were a very progressive thing articulated uh, by Roosevelt. And it's really amazing to think that like all these years later, they were not even talking about these things really in any serious way. Uh, and the reason, if you want to understand why, think about the fifth freedom, which you may have forgotten about. Uh, this was Roosevelt had his four freedom speech, but then apparently a bunch of people got together uh, with money and they said, um, excuse me, excuse me. You forgot about the fifth freedom free enterprise, okay, which is capitalism. Like they, they had to do this and they put out little ad campaigns. And if you look on this one, you could actually order this poster, which it's funny because it, it almost looks satirical. Like some guy's got his house bombed and uh, he looks pretty desperate. And then Uncle Sam comes along with a free enterprise thing. It's like, is this, is this a joke? But uh, no, they didn't. They really were thinking that we should include the fifth freedom, which is capitalism. <laughs> but they call it free enterprise, of course. Um, now there was a, America had its most progressive president and by far the most progressive vice president was Henry Wallace. And he was an anti-fascist and he spoke about fascism. He wrote about, he wrote this in, uh, I believe in, it was either in the New York, New Republic or the New York times, but he wrote an essay on American fascists. And that's where this quote comes from. If we define an American fascist as one who in case of conflict puts money and power ahead of human beings, then there are undoubtedly several million fascists in the United States. Well, Wallace himself was removed from the vice presidential spot in 1944 via a coup, more or less, by um, a, a guy connected to Standard Oil and who was the Democratic Party treasurer, a guy named Pauly. And uh, Wallace was the second most popular Democratic politician, second most popular politician in the country uh, of all besides Franklin Roosevelt. But he was not somebody that the oligarchs liked. And so he gets replaced by someone else. When Pearl Harbor happens, the U.S. is going to enter the war. You know, people question as to how much foreknowledge the U.S. had, but it is pretty clear that FDR wanted to enter the war, but he wanted the Japanese to fire the first shot. There are quotes pretty much to that effect exactly. The guy that ends up being president is Harry Truman, or vice president, because they remove Henry Wallace. And Harry Truman was, and as a senator, he once said this, which I think explains why he was acceptable to the American oligarchy. He says... If we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. And that way, let them kill as many as possible. Um, that is a, a deep thinking from an American statesman. Of course, America wins the World War II, uh, nukes two Japanese cities gratuitously, and then emerges onto the world stage. And immediately, they're already looking to basically present the world in terms that allow the U.S. to aggressively go out there and pursue its interests, but all always in a supposedly defensive way. Uh, George Kennan with the long telegram writes that we have a political force committed to the belief that there can be no modus vivendi with the United States. It's the biggest task our diplomacy has ever faced and ever will have to. Okay. I, I don't believe there was any reason to say this in 1946. The Soviets had lost 27 million people. They absolutely wanted to find a modus vivendi with the United States. Uh, and, and this is just not true. I believe he was just saying what Dean Acheson, his boss, wanted him to say. Uh, and so he wrote he wrote this in 1946. Keep in mind, 1946, the U.S. goes from nuking uh, Japan gratuitously when they were they wanted to surrender anyway. And then in 1946, a year later, uh, they are telling Russia that they're going to nuke them, their ally. They're saying we're going to nuke you. That we're going to nuke you, Soviet Union, if you don't pull out of Iran uh, immediately. And 
Iran and the Soviet Union are both quite far from the United States, of course. Now, the way that the U.S. fascism is really uh, one key element of it is the clandestine state, the covert operations. So planned and executed that any U.S. government responsibility for them is not evident to unauthorized persons. And if uncovered, the U.S. government can plausibly disclaim any responsibility for them. This is written in 1948. So they're already thinking about how they need to start doing operations that they will be able to plausibly deny. Uh, and when out of this clandestine realm, we get things like these pretexts uh, that lead to wars, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, when the U.S. wasn't really attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin, except maybe the night before. But what they lied about was the fact that this was actually a provocation, that the U.S. was uh, there. U.S. ships were supporting raids on in the north from the south uh, that were not really legal, uh, but the U.S. was doing it anyway. Instead, they said we got attacked. Or it was unprovoked. It leads to the Vietnam War. U.S. loses the Vietnam War on paper, but I, I don't. I increasingly think that they basically did not lose the Vietnam War. What I mean is that the U.S. position after World, the Vietnam War, once the dust settles, is actually stronger. A big part of this is because in 1965, there's a coup in Venezuela that I think the U.S. was behind every aspect of it, and they murder uh, 500,000. The massacre 500,000 to three million Indonesian peasants. Uh, who were a big part of Sukarno's base, and they put in this guy who was already a CIA asset before this whole thing went down, uh, Suharto, and he runs the U.S., uh, runs the Indonesia as a U.S. puppet, more or less, uh, for about 30 years. What people didn't know at the time, or Americans didn't know, the president didn't know, uh, President Kennedy didn't know this, President Sukarno didn't know this, the world's biggest gold deposit was in Indonesia. Uh, it was untapped, but it's a uh, a ridiculous amount of money. It's in West Papua, and it really couldn't be exploited until like the 70s and 80s, but they knew it was there going back as far as the 30s, and Alan Dulles knew it was there. Alan Dulles never told JFK this. This is in uh, Greg Polgrain's book. He's a Australian uh, history professor. So this was because of this, because of Indonesia, when the U.S. wrecks the Bretton Woods system, the dollar system, which was tied to gold, uh, it creates a new dollar system, and the U.S., because it has control of oil and control of gold, they uh, by the time that this whole new system gets worked out in the, under Reagan, the U.S. can basically print as much money as it wants. This is uh, the basis, really, of American dominance up to the present day, and that is what is fading right now, actually, as countries de-dollarize. Uh, this is all being reversed as we speak. Uh, the last part of that, or another key part of the sort of clandestine state, in, uh, or clandestine deep politics really shoring up the U.S. empire is the Yom Kippur War, which has the effect of uh, probably the designed effect of raising oil prices 400%, and that saves the U.S. dollar, basically, uh, because all of the money goes into all the dollars that other countries had saved up uh, that the U.S. couldn't redeem in gold like they were supposed to. They had to spend it all on oil because the oil was so expensive and the oil was denominated in dollars. Um, you see the gas shortages and the huge spike in oil prices uh, that you can see um, here. Okay, another aspect of American fascism is Gladio, Operation Gladio, uh, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, the NATO's, NATO stay behind armies. A good book on that from Daniel Ganser, drug traffickers, ultra right-wingers in Western Europe to defend uh, in case of an invasion. But really, they get used as a strategy of tension, meaning that you can stage terrorist attacks and then you can blame the communists. And it's a way to manipulate politics in Western Europe uh, because you can blame these on communists, the Red Guards, and say, oh, they're, the communist terrorists are, are killing all these people and we need to support the state and fight communism. It's a way to discredit the left. There are probably a number of assassinations that we can attribute to this in Western Europe that have been pivotal in, in, in Western European political history since the end of World War II. The Aldo Moro assassination, Henry Kissinger told Aldo Moro that if he continued with his compromise to try to create a left-wing coalition government, he'd be killed. Uh, and then Moro proceeded and Moro was killed. Olaf Palma was probably killed by some of these networks. The Swedish internationalist prime minister um, later found dead in his car. Um, oh wait, that was Aldo Moro, sorry. Um, Aldo, Olaf Palm was killed on the, was shot on the street. Aldo Moro was killed and then later found in a car. 
the German Alfred Herrhausen, this banker who really wanted to do wanted Germany to be more integrated with Eastern Europe and even with Russia. Uh, he dies in a car bomb that couldn't possibly have been set off by the people they said did it. Uh, so that was probably a similar thing. So really, the deep state has been the, the dictator of Europe as well, um, which if you understand that, think about what we see today. Would they blow up the Nord Stream, which is terrible to German industry? And what does Germany do? They just say, oh, we, we still love America. We know you didn't. We know you wouldn't do this. But like everybody knows this. This is like the, the power of the U.S. over Europe, it's just, uh, it's embarrassing, really. Uh, in sweet, in, in uh, the, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, all those Stieg Larsson books, these are really references to Gladio type networks. If you guys have seen these movies or read these books. He died in a weird way too, but I, I can't really comment too much on that. Now, part of the challenge to this basically disguised fascist global dominance system comes from uh, the, um, well, the emergence of a countervailing force. Multipolarity. Uh, this article is written in 2009, but the, the woman's writing about how since the late 90s, the concept of multipolarity has gained prominence around the globe. Russia and China include it or allude to it in nearly all their joint declarations dating from the mid 90s to the present. Present. So this is what happens in the mid 90s: is you get this. Um, the, the 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 Cold War has ended. And these other great, formerly great powers, powerful countries, Russia and China are saying, we don't really like this system where one country calls all the shots. We should have a multipolar world. And that's in the mid 90s. Now, the response from these elements of the U.S. deep state are different than any sort of multipolarity or international law. On the Israeli side, which I think is very important to think about right now, you had this report, a clean break, a new strategy for securing the realm a study group uh, led by Richard Pearl uh, for Benjamin Netanyahu, who was then the prime minister of Israel, of course is now. And it also included guys who would be in the Bush administration and be part of the Iraq war project, uh, Douglas Fife and David Wormser. But here they're working for Israeli think tank, basically. Uh, and part of it said, removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq is an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. Other parts of the report talk about just basically weakening all the rest of the states in the Middle East so that no one can really challenge uh, Israeli, U.S. Israeli dominance in the region. And that would include um, also, you know, basically abandoning the peace process. So this is, I think, very fateful to look at and think about what we have seen the U.S. do since the mid-90s and where our foreign policy has been taking us. The other part of the U.S. establishment, uh, you know, the, this sort of U.S. deep state, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, he's the, he, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, the same outfit that planned the U.S. empire. They commissioned him to write the Grand Chessboard, uh, which is arguing for dominance over Eurasia. So basically all the areas between Western Europe and through the, through the Middle East and, and uh, Central Asia, we just need to make sure that we control those so we can be the hegemon and rule the world, keep ruling the world. That's And this comes out in like 1997, 1998. So this is a response more or less, this is the Americans' response to China and Russia saying, hey, we want multipolarity. Instead, the U.S. Is, is saying, no, we need to dominate. And this is our plan for it. And even more aggressive than Brzezinski is the Project for a New American Century. Uh, and they're rebuilding America's defenses uh, report that came out. That's the one that infamously calls for uh, full-spectrum dominance, control over cyberspace and outer space and ocean floor and I don't even know, probably the center of the earth. I mean, who knows? They wanted to dominate everything they could dominate forever. Uh, and they said, it's going to be hard to get the American public to go along with this unless uh, there's some kind of a new Pearl Harbor. And they wrote that in 2000. All throughout the, mid the 1990s, however, you also had this McJihad phenomenon where the former uh, Mujahideen, Al what would go on to be Al-Qaeda, they were used as like shock troops, basically, in places like Chechnya, Kosovo, Bosnia, Libya. Uh, they tried to use the MI6 tried to use Al Qaeda to assassinate Muammar Gaddafi in like 1996. I mean, this was this is a very strange time period because it's. I mean, when you look at where it went, it's uh, really fascinating. Let's say, and then you have 9/11 and uh, the anthrax letters. So these this plan for world domination and control of the Middle East is out there. Uh, different people like Brzezinski and the PNAC crowd are all saying. Even Brzezinski makes references to how, like, you needed a Pearl Harbor to get World War II going. Uh, so then, you know, it, onto the main stage comes 9-11, uh, 
a, a spectacle that really um, motivated the U.S. to go abroad and start some wars. You also had the anthrax letters that came right after it. And that one is very strange because uh, they, as part of the U.S. government, as part of the security state, tra does its job and traces this to an American laboratory. I think it was Fort Detrick, right? And the Ames anthrax strain. Uh, so why would some government employee be pretending or employees be pretending to be uh, a fundamentalist Muslim terrorist? Uh, we don't know because the person that they blamed it on uh, supposedly committed suicide, one of those Epstein-like suicides. Right. I mean, this was this is really an amazing thing. Even Pat Leahy, uh, the U.S. senator, doesn't believe the government's story here, but he doesn't really complain about it too much, which is like they, they I think they killed one of the people on his staff, perhaps, or at least put made them really sick. And even he is like, well, I don't believe them, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just a, a, a U.S. senator. After all, how could I ever expect to have these questions answered? Uh, Iraqi WMD criminality, right? This is just state criminality. Make up a story about how there's all these dangerous weapons and that somehow that would give you the right to invade another country. Um, and I don't want to, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip ahead and not go over all these things. But I want to get more to the like point of like where we are at this particular moment, because I think that the, I've had conversations with people about this, like Larry Wilkerson recently said, um, that it's never the U.S. the state of U.S. foreign policy, the state of U.S. hegemony has never been so bad as it is right now. I think that when I'm saying after the PNAC fails, I don't mean the organization. I mean like the actual thing we've been living through, like since the end of the Cold War. These people trying to create a new American century. Now that this project to create American hegemony forever has is failing, uh, what in the world can be done to redeem? the U.S. and the West, because I cannot imagine how they can reverse this anyway. Uh, of course, they could likely, it's possible that they could get us all nuked. And I would just say, if that's the case, and we really don't have any problems anyway, so whatever, what are you going to do about that? But assuming that we don't blow up the world and end human civilization, uh, we could think about how to deal with the, our new situation of having to act like a normal country who needs to get along with other countries. It means that we need to end this exception uh, where the, the state can do whatever it wants. It means no more American Fuhrer principle, right? Uh, the Fuhrer principle was where Hitler said, whatever the leader does, they, they do. I mean, that's just how it is. You just have to take it, right? That's what the U.S. does more or less. Whenever they say rules-based liberal international order, they're really just saying that system where the U.S. just tells everybody how it's going to be, and they just have to accept it. I don't, And I don't think that this, this is not going to be operant anymore. I, I smushed all the words together so it would seem more German because that seems more appropriate there. Um, no more inverting, no more inventing reality as with all these apex crimes and covert operations and state crimes against democracy. That's Lance DeHaven Smith's term or deep events. This idea of like the U.S. is going to be able to just somehow uh, through chicanery and shenanigans make these events happen and then say like, we didn't do anything about that. This is not really a way to do business anymore. I mean, no, uh, the world does not believe that this, the coup or that the uh, there was a revolution in Ukraine, for example, in 2014. They don't believe that the, the Nord Stream pipeline blew up itself. I mean, it's just this way of trying to, this way of trying to rule the world through just lying and brazen criminality all the time. The whole world is disgusted by it. And it's really getting a an exclamation point with Gaza. As you see, just, it, the sad thing about Gaza or one of the horrifying things is that it, it seems to basically encapsulate the, the way the West is operated. If the, if you are inconvenient to the dictates of Western hegemony, you will just be slaughtered uh, if they can get away with it. And uh, that's international law, domestic law. There's nothing that can restrain uh, the empire up to this point. So what are things that we could actually hold to as, as West in the West, as Americans, and I, this is, if I say freedom exclamation point, I mean, we all, free enterprise, you kind of roll your eyes or you hear any libertarians talk about like, you know, freedom this, freedom that. But these things, uh, these American freedoms, civil rights that we have, political rights that they often take from us or withhold from us, these are things that we should probably really try to center in our political organizing because they do appeal to a, a majority of the population. Um, you can get people on your side saying free speech, generally speaking, if you can have an honest debate about it. Most people 
believe that in the U.S. It really wasn't until recently that people started saying like, wow, free speech might be bad, actually. It's no coincidence that those are the things you start hearing when the establishment loses its ability to tell people how it's going to be. That's when you start hearing people call for censorship because they've lost control of it. They don't, they can't, power cannot make an honest argument about itself anymore. So they're trying to keep people from really telling the truth about the regime we live under. Maybe to advocate something like a global bill of rights, but to just advocate it verbally and by example, not by funding CIA or NED operations to manipulate a country. What we need is internationalism not supranationalism. Internationalism is cooperation between nations, right? It's not um, elimination of nations. It means nations will work together. Supranationalism is, uh, is imperialism in this context. So lawful international cooperation between nations, not a centralized globo sovereign, which is really what the U.S. has attempted to be. First, only over the free world, meaning that it left out the communist countries during the Cold War, but eventually they, they worked to roll back communism and they succeeded. But this perhaps set in motion things that would hurt them because this allowed the Russians and Chinese to enter even more fully into international trade systems. And it's creating these dialectical forces that are weakening the U.S. Um, and this is why they're wanting to like try to cut Russia off from trade or do anything they can to try to keep uh, these events from moving as they are moving. But eventually, we are headed towards a multipolar world. If we don't blow it up, then we will see the end of U.S. hegemony, uh, and maybe sooner than we think. I would not be surprised if there was not a normal election next year. You've already heard people like Biden and Trump, like they're avoiding debates or they may not even debate. I really think it's more likely than not that Biden will not run. Um, a new world is being born. And uh, the sooner, the better, I would think, because these two fascist projects, the U.S. parafascism, this disguised fascism of the whole world, is, is no longer considered legitimate by the vast majority of the global population. And they finally have enough power collectively to stand up to the West. Uh, and likewise, the Israeli side project or the side fascism little buddy uh, in, over in the Middle East it's more blood and soil kind of fascism. I mean, I don't see how this is long for the world either. Either they will try to find some way to live there, or it may mean the end of the Israeli state. I mean, I've heard more people that I take seriously actually saying they think that we are seeing events that are going to lead to the end of uh, the Israeli state. So could that be saved with a, a two-state solution or something else that we don't see coming? I don't know, but I I think they have to actually change because they can't just uh, murder everyone to stay on top anymore. This is a new situation for the West. This marks the end, really, of centuries of Western domination of the world. And uh, it is exciting, and it's also a bit horrifying uh, because it could potentially mean the end of the world if the U.S. oligarchy try goes too far trying to gamble and ends up setting off a nuclear exchange. Or it could mean some real economic shocks to the United States, because honestly, our whole system seems to depend on the largesse of empire and these rents that we collect just from having a free ride of U.S. hegemony and the ability to print whatever money we want. Uh, and, and so we have a, a society and a, we have institutions that are corrupted by this kind of power all the way down uh, the, the, for decades of it. And we're dysfunctional in this way. We've been We've organized everything around empire and global dominance and when that goes away, these are not institutions that are really good for supporting human life. And it's so there have to be big adjustments. And uh, I think I could open that up for any discussion. I hope that that was not too much to throw out there all uh, in one sitting. But I try to have a little bit of the theory and then some of the chronology of how we got to this point, because this is really a uh, a, a momentous time that we're living through. Thanks so much, Aaron. You're giving us a, a ton to think about. Uh, very interesting. Um, so as you said, let's open it up for uh, comments and questions from the audience. Um, go ahead and use the raise hand button and we'll um, mostly take people in the order they come. Uh, we might do a little swapping around if just to keep, um, you know, gender stack here from a range of you know, voices and backgrounds. But I see James and Laura jumping right in. So let's take those first. Uh, James, go go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks again, uh, Aaron. Um, uh, 
I'm going to bring in a, a topic you kind of you didn't quite go in very deep on, and that is think tanks. And um, I got thinking about think tanks just recently because there was an article in Mint uh, Mint Press that was talking about the United Against Nuclear Iran think tank, which when you go and look at the uh, members of the board, it was, um, you know, it had guys like John Bolton. It had a couple of um, of former directors of Mossad. It had Jeb Bush. It had a billionaire CEO. It had Otto Reich, uh, who was, you know, from the U.S. coup in, in Venezuela. I mean, it had just kind of a, a, a large number of um, names that I recognize. In fact, I, it got me thinking it was like another safari club is what it almost read like. And so I was wondering if you could just say something about um, the role that you think think tanks are playing in the deep state. And, and we're short on right. time. So could I take two questions at once? Let's go ahead sure. and I'll hear from Laura and then we'll get you to respond, Aaron. Okay, my question um, was that I, I saw it flash by in the slides that you skipped over, but I know I've heard from so many people that are making um, their electoral decisions based on COVID. And somebody at the rally today the, uh, in San Francisco for Palestine, somebody came up to me and said, the Green Party was in favor of the authoritarian um, lockdowns about COVID, and I'm going to go libertarian is looking good to me. Um, my main worry about this is that there are so many things that people may agree with the Green Party in terms of peace and social justice and grassroots democracy and um, all those good things, the environment. But with the COVID and them seeing it as a fascist authoritarian kind of a takeover, um, how can we how can we deal with that? And I'll give my personal point of view, is that everybody was faced with a bad decision. We had a bad choice of getting vaccinated, and we had a bad choice of not getting vaccinated. And I wish we had a country like Cuba and, uh, and dozens of others around the world that give provide health care to their um, people so that the drug companies are not in the business that are in the business of ma making sure that their people are healthy, not that the drug companies are making profits. So sorry for such a long question, but I wanted to both say COVID and say what my concern is that it will separate people from a political party that basically is on their side. Thanks. Back to you, Aaron. Um, as for think tanks, I think they absolutely are a element of the deep state and that they represent oligarchic power. It's a way to have sinecures for people when they're in between government jobs. And uh, there's no think tank that's, uh, I mean, with my book that I wrote and my critique of U.S. imperialism, I mean, I, I basically knew that I was not going to, it was going to be unlikely that I would get tenure. So I have a podcast. I'm not able to like write a sequel to the book. I'd like to do that, but I can't because I'm really busy with other things day to day because the, it's too radical for the university. Likewise, I won't be in a think tank because these are all paid for by rich people who have these think tanks because they want to advance certain objectives. Like uh, in the case of the one you're talking about with Iran, that just seems like a pro-Zionist neocon thing. They're obsessed with Iran, so they would hire all these people. And that's just a way to have more power in civil society. And you know, who's, uh, who's the big piece, the big anti-war think tank? Who hires people that are like that really question the legitimacy of the state and so on and of this whole enterprise? There is none. There's, it's just there aren't the people that have a ton of money generally like the system. And so they don't want radical critiques of things. So think tanks are a way to reproduce hegemony. As for COVID, um, I differ from the a lot of the people on the left. I uh, I believe in medical freedom. I think that we do that we have corporate capture of our regulatory agencies. Big Pharma is horrifying to me. And um, I, I, I thought that the uh, vac vaccine mandates were, it was strange that they went with an untested uh, technology for this. And I think that, so I didn't, uh, I didn't want to get that vaccine. I was forced to get a vaccine for my job, but I got the J&J &J one, um, but I had COVID anyway. I caught COVID anyway, and I, sh I think I should have not had to get a vaccine at all because I got it in like in January when I went out to LA 
Um, I was went out to see Oliver Stone actually uh, to be interviewed for that JFK documentary, and that's when I got COVID. So I had it, and it was annoying, but it wasn't that terrible. I think that the statistics show that the Swedes did much better than the United States, and we were told that oh God, Swede is just going to be turned into a, a a killing field, right? Statistically, they did way better than us. But people were so emotionally invested in this that they're not even really able to look at it even now. Even now, they don't. People, I, I kind of avoid talking about it because I just don't even want to, uh, uh, you know, deal with people who are so emotional about the whole thing. So medical freedom is, uh, I, I think that people should support that. And I also think that uh, it was strange that it was right wing people talking about corporate regulatory capture and the left was like somehow not, they didn't find those arguments persuasive. Uh, I, I, it's, this is very strange. Very strange that that uh, it worked out this way. I don't know. Um, and the fact that we got this vaccine and they lied to us and said, "Oh yeah, you take it. That's you stopping the transmission. This will this will wipe it out." And they never actually tested it. They totally deceived the public about that. And that and that still doesn't impact the thinking of a lot of the people who were more um, in favor of aggressive uh, state, you know, measures about this. So. I, I think that the Green Party ought to, I think every party ought to be on the side of medical freedom. I don't think you should force people to get injections uh, for, if they want to be a part of normal society. I don't think you can create a medical apartheid state. I, I think this state that I just described to you is totally criminal and horrifying. And Big Pharma is a part of that. Big Pharma is the, they're the people that employed George H.W. Bush when he left uh, the CIA. He went to a nice sinecure, Eli Lilly. And I believe that Donald Rumsfeld, after he left the Ford administration, went to GD Searle, which is a pharmaceutical entity. I mean, they're as bad as any other major uh, set of corporations. So um, anyway, I'm, I'll stop <laughs> so we can go on to something else. I don't, I really don't want to talk about COVID too much more. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's go on to two more. Um, Fred and then Steve, uh, both of you in that order. Go ahead and unmute. Unmute, please, Fred. Can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I am curious whether Aaron has more to say about the relationship between Israel um, and the United States. Um, some of the, the history that I believe that I know about is that the Mossad helped or maybe even ran the operation to bring down the Twin Towers in 9-11. In, um, uh, I also saw a, uh, just a brief mention that it was an Israeli company that was providing the secure email service for the Congress when it was out to lunch with, with having been contaminated with anthrax. So I'm wondering whether part of why we're treating Israel like a 51st state and running interference for them, it, whether they're how they're interconnected with our deep state, in order mm -hmm. to do that. Yes, the uh, very. I've been thinking about this subject a lot. I've even had some conversations with Peter Dell Scott about this, which were very interesting. Which I, I don't think I can totally share because they're sort of incompetence. But my own sense is that I I always believed that. I mean, I understood that they had a big role in the agenda, the 9-11 war, war on terror agenda, and that Bush, um, you know, really let them in. But I, I discovered, I learned, uh, I heard Larry talk about this, and I'd heard it before, and then I, I thought about it again. George H.W. Bush actually told the Israelis that if, that they needed, if they didn't agree to these discussions about a Palestinian state, then he was going to withhold loan guarantees from them. And so they, that he forced them to negotiate. And Larry Wilkerson was saying that he thinks that that's why he they lost. There's a Times of Israel article that that says that that basically the lobby really did try to make sure he lost, and they're kind of cagey about it. But I bet that's what happened to George Bush in 1992. I bet he lost because he went against Israel because that guy is Mister Establishment number one of the U.S. I mean, he's a sinister guy. He seems to represent like the same thing as like Alan Dulles. Like I think the people that killed JFK and such, like that part of the U.S. deep state, that's George H.W. Bush. But then he loses because some other aspect is more powerful than him and apparently can manipulate things more. And then you think about what happens, the 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 clean break thing that I just read. That's an Israeli thing. 
and the George W. Bush wins, and he embraces these guys, the guys that his father said were too crazy, the neocons and the and and also standing up to Israel. George W. Bush seems to have taken that lesson and said, uh, let's let, I, I'm gonna actually help these guys and they'll probably get me a second term. And sure enough, he does get a second term despite being a criminal who ran a disastrous a, a first term, he still gets reelected. So if you look at where American foreign policy has gone wrong since the end of the Cold War, this is the argument made by Mearsheimer and Walt, who are very uh, immaculate scholars, really. Uh, in the Israel lobby, they wrote that um, it's the, the, the influence of the Israel lobby has taken the U.S. away from a, a decent, uh, realist, and reasonable foreign policy and made them do kind of dumb things, because that's actually been the story that we're seeing right now. The U.S. is about to lose its status as the global hegemon, and a lot of it has to do with stupid military adventures that when you look at them and you think, gosh, who would have benefited from us trying to like use al-Qaeda to overthrow Israel or uh, starting the Iraq war, um, um, uh, using, trying to use al-Qaeda to overthrow the Syrian government is what I mean. And then that fails, but then we're still occupying part of Syria. I mean, all of these things seem to go, they get blamed on the neocons, but the neocons are intertwined. And some of them are the same people themselves, like Richard Pearl, uh, Douglas Fife, uh, who are connected to Israel. So the neocon Zionist nexus, its connection to American politicians is very strong. I read in a book going back to the 60s about when a young congressman was writing to Robert Kennedy about, hey, you shouldn't try to, um, can you send me some information on how you're trying to make the American Zionist Council have to register as a foreign uh, agent? Because he was against that, right? And that's Donald Rumsfeld in the 60s with this connection to the Zionist lobby, right? And then these guys end up being some of the main people pushing the global war on terror. So I think Israel is a huge part of the American deep state. And look at it right now. You have three contenders for president right now. Uh, and even though 70% of the U.S. public wants a ceasefire in Gaza, not a one of them will actually side with 70% of the U.S. public. Okay, it's a totalitarian thing it, when you think about it, totalitarian meaning that there's no aspect of civil society that can reliably stand up to Israel, not in academia. You know, think of what happened to um, Norman Finkelstein or the president of Harvard, and the president of Harvard wasn't even pro-Palestinian. She just uh, said that she wasn't going to rearrange all the schools, throw their free speech policies out the rule to satisfy like the mob of, you know, Zionist uh, knuckle draggers. I mean, it was a crazy thing that that happened. And, uh, or the media, they fired Mehdi Hassan, who is like the most corporate, I mean, kind of a bootlicking dude on MSNBC, always like cheering on America's next war. But because he has some sympathy for the Palestinians, they're like, you got to go too. The political system can't stand up to it. I mean, this is uh, even high schools. I've been, I'm at high school, private high schools on the East Coast, I used, where I used to work. Um, I mean, they're around Philly. There are multiple cases where, like, they have somebody come in who's a Palestinian speaker, and immediately they get all these calls about donors and everything else. My friends at Indiana University, his his, uh, his faculty sponsor for the Palestinian group that they, that he's a part of, got suspended on a technicality. It was totally ridiculous, but they suspended him out in Indiana. So it's like you can't you can hardly overstate their influence all across civil society and in the government and in the media, it is uh, kind of horrifying. And it's, if you, all of those facts are things that we knew, but it, it's like seeing them get away with genocide the way that they are now and just slaughtering babies. Uh, yeah, it's the most horrific thing. And you're like, wow, they have, they, the fact that they're able to do this is staggering and no wonder people are horrified to, to say anything about them because they destroy your career. I mean, and they've done some crazy things over the years. I mean, they used, uh, back in the 50s, no, 1963, they hired a Nazi, Otto Skorzeny, who was like Hitler's favorite, you know, terrorist, basically. But he survived the war. Uh, Mossad hired him to uh, go and kill uh, a German scientist who was working with the Egyptians and then dissolve him into acid. I mean, these people will kill anyone. They'll work with anyone. Uh, they are they are fanatical in a way that that... It defies explanation if you're a, a social scientist or a historian, because we're used to thinking of like, oh, yeah, people have these rational motives and they do this and they do that. But I think that some of the craziness that you have seen in U.S. foreign policy that doesn't even make sense in terms of imperialism, because it's actually damaging the U.S. position, 
Israel actually is uh, explains a lot more than I think many people want to admit. But I'm not saying they control everything. It's an alliance between opportunistic people in the U.S., people like Rumsfeld, Cheney, and others, uh, and and Zionists who are very, very motivated about this issue. It's like a, I mean, it, it's core to their political identity, and it's absolutely insane. Uh, and here we are. Yeah, we can we can have further conversations about the uh, <clears throat> history of the U.S. Um, giving the Nazis a pass, and the is the what became Israel getting support from the Nazis. Um, that's a whole a whole another part of the covert history. I won't go into that now, but. I think I think that there is um, this deep state that's grown since minimum, minimum the end of the Second World War. I've seen documents that point toward um, the Brits having arranged World War One so that they could knock out Germany as a potential imperial competitor. Fred, can we oh, yeah, let somebody that's, else that's, that's talk? True, yeah. talk yeah, let's uh, let's move on to uh, Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead and unmute. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. All right. Good. Um, I have to say that I found your analysis uh, kind of superficial because you're looking at the way in which things work out in the surface and what we can see from you know, media uh, stories or uh, underground or uh, um, uh, what um, uh, people who, 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 who know that the individuals who know the under the under uh, the underlying um, uh, um, workings of these these events and they get they get fairly, uh, you know, like um, uh, complex. And uh, they become ridiculous after a while. Uh, but your your presentation is about fascism. And um, so I'm looking for a way in which fascism can be defined within the United States structure uh, or the West structure, the United States and Europe and uh, Japan uh as a as a class phenomenon as a um uh, um a way in which government let's say multinational government can uh, uh do something and have a function and a um a topic for itself that it has to then promulgate and i don't see any uh, you know, you have the, the we have the 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 uh, the issue of, of uh, um, uh, uh, Israel, and we have the uh, um, the sanctions against uh, Russia, and we have uh, the uh, play with um, say Iran's uh, nuclear weapons, which they uh, don't have, and what the purposes of those elements are, but there's no kind of cohesive focus for all of this stuff that would make it think, that would make, at least uh, make somebody think that this was a form of fascism. So I'm wondering, you know, like, uh, is, is, there some, uh, is there some kind of under, uh, underlying um, uh, account that you could put together that would give us some way of taking a look at this. Okay, this is fascism. This is the United States form of fascism. This is the uh, corporate form of fascism. It has, you know, like all kinds of other things like the deep state and so forth, but that would, would give it a purpose and would therefore arm us in terms of uh, defense or an opposition or a, a, a means of organizing against it uh, um, uh, as a as 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 on a communal and class uh, and 
racial racialized uh, basis um, other than just looking at these events that you know like come up yeah the overall objective and guiding mission of the u.s version of fascism is global dominance empire i mean that's that's what they that was the reason that this regime was created after world war ii and it's lawless exceptionalist component which is really where the fascism comes from. It's not lawful. It's not open and transparent. It's despotic and des top-down despotism in an industrialized uh, political system that is capitalist is fascism, more or less. So uh, this is, that's, I mean, I is a little bit more in the definition there, but that's really the heart of it. I mean, I had a kind of a long um, definition of the American version of fascism and its national, its project is global domination. They want to dominate as much of the world as is possible. And that's why they're doing all these different things in all these different parts of the world. Um, so as far as how we can organize uh, on a local level, I think that this this regime, this fascist project uh, that began at the end of World War II, the US attempting to rule the world, which you cannot rule the world as a liberal lawful democracy. This is the reason why they had to create a, a kind of a fascist top-down system because you can't rule the world that way if you don't. If you rule the world that way, then all those elections where they elected people that nationalized resources, those people would have won in those countries and those countries would have pursued their own uh, national interest rather than subordinating themselves to the uh, interests of US corporations. So they had to be doing all of these fascist things uh, like overthrowing Iran's government, Indonesia's government, Congo's government, et cetera, et cetera, uh, suppressing whatever at home with, you know, criminal despotism they break the law all the time that is the exception that's why it's called american exception it's it's uh what how carl schmidt defined sovereignty and he was an, a, a nazi of course and he said sovereign is he who decides the exception well in the u.s case the u.s version of fascism it's always an emergency it's the cold war it was a never-ending emergency so they had to break laws all the time and have all this state secrecy because they said they were fighting the Cold War, but really they want to rule the world. It's more of a cover story, uh, just like democracy becomes a cover story for fascism. So it's the lawless enterprise of running the world requires a, a fascist regime because you can't be lawful about it. And that's uh, what we had in the United States. And if you were anybody and you stood in the way of the, of the empire, uh, then they would kill you if they could, including the president of the United States who was shot drive, riding down the street and it was clear right away that he was shot from the front. His brain exited out the back from somebody who hit him from the front, and they covered that up right away. It could only be the apex of power that did that, and that's a fascist. That's fascism. If the demo if democracy is not allowed to win, uh, the president with the highest approval rating of, in in history gets assassinated in broad daylight, and they can't do anything about it. That's a sign that it is not a democratic system that we're living in. It's another kind of system. It's fascistic, and its goal is global dominance, and it's now crumbling apart. So as far as how you can organize against this sort of power, well, it's the it's it's crumbling as it is. So uh, there, it's very easy to suppress, to establish hegemony at home before you go out to become an empire. I wish I could say that there's something that we could personally do. The, the work is being done now by people uh, in Russia and people in China who have built a prosperous society. And the people in Gaza who, just by becoming martyrs, are actually showing the naked illegitimacy of this fascist project with our little fascist thug buddy uh, over in the Holy Land, who's uh, now attempting to liquidate a whole population of people, uh, which is really uh, a good microcosm for what Western imperial is, what Western imperialism is.